Perfect. So this is being recorded just for for future um, sharing, just so y'all know. Um, okay, so although we are gathering in a digital space right now, um, it is very important to acknowledge the land that this work is taking place on and where it's being organized from. So firstly, Artscape has many sites in Toronto, and we would like to acknowledge that the diversity of the first peoples of this area, known as Takaranto, and honor the stewardship of the Huron Wendat, the Iroquois Haudenosaunee, and the Anishinaabe, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit. Today, Toronto is still home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are so grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community on this territory. Um, the ZB site is on the border of Ottawa Gatineau, as I said, and we'd like to acknowledge that that is situated on the traditional Algonquin and Anishinaabe territory. So a little about this project. Artscape uh, created a virtual residency program in collaboration with Brendan, the amazing residency manager. <laughs> there he is. And for 10 weeks, seven artists gathered in a virtual space to co-design a series of public artworks for ZB, which is a 34 acre a community development project on the border, as they said, of Ottawa Gatineau. Uh, through immersing themselves in history, politics, and future vision of the land, collaborating with the site's Memengueshi Council and co designing with the ZB team, a series of public art concepts were developed very recently. A uh, quick intro into Artscape. Um, so, Artscape makes space for creativity and transforms communities. We are a not-for-profit organization based in Toronto who collaborates with artists, community leaders, uh, public policy advocates, urban developers, so that our work builds value for everybody. Uh, Artscape started 30 years ago uh, to create affordable housing and studio spaces for artists, and we really believe that there is such a deep connection between thriving artists and thriving communities. In 2019, we launched a new social enterprise under Artscape called Atelier, which I'm part of. And it really was to collaborate with the urban development sector and municipalities to expand the landscape for public art and create meaningful opportunities for artists to participate in the city building process. Our partnership with ZB is an experiment in artists collaborating in the co-design process with urban developers. And today we're gonna to spend some time to reflect on the experiences, uh, the process, and to draw lessons that we can apply in future. I will send a link to the Artscape site on the chat and I encourage you all to take a further look later on. A quick intro into ZB. Uh, ZB is a 34 acre community development project on the border of Ottawa, Canada. This master plan city is steeped in history and looks towards the future. It's a community that overlooks the Ottawa River and will be home to over 5,000 people and over 6,000 jobs when it is completed. It will be Canada's most sustainable neighborhood and it'll be a community offering endless paths to a better living. I will also put in the Z site um, on the chat later as well and I encourage you to take a further look at all the amazing things they're doing there. A little bit about this talk. Um, so this session will reflect on the co-design process between artists and urban developers, the role of the artists in shaping public spaces and the nature of creating the creative process in the digital realm. For the next 85 minutes, Marissa will be facilitating the discussion with the ZB virtual residency uh, artists, which is Dom, Melody, Ryan, Remco, Noah, John, Nate, and the residency manager, Brendan, of course. For the last 15 minutes, there will be a Q&A uh, from the audience. So please do type in any questions you may have in the Q&A um, throughout the talk and I'll follow along and uh, Marissa will ask some of them at the end. And of course, we'll do our best to answer as many as we can um, in, the, in those 15 minutes. Okay, a little intro into Marissa. I know she's not gonna like this. It makes her sweat to hear someone else talk about her. But <laughs> I'm gonna do it. Um, so our facilitator today is Marissa Galami who is an Ottawa-born visual artist and culture sponge. Uh, she's informed by womanhood, motherhood, Philippines third culture shock, 
projects are practice spans, sculpture, assemblage, site-specific installations, storytelling, and arts advocacy. So she's very busy. Since first exhibiting work in 2009, Mirsa has been active throughout Ottawa with performative works, installations for music and art festivals, art making workshops. She has created programs for several Ottawa venues and has produced a large scale public art piece for the city of Mississauga. Through an ongoing exploration of found objects and repurposed materials uh, and a commitment to social practice, uh, by means of art programming in non-gallery spaces, Marissa's work leans deeply into Buckminster Fuller's query. Now, how do we make the spaceship work? Good question. So I hope you didn't sweat too much, Marissa. <laughs> um, okay, a little intro into the artist. Uh, our virtual residency artists are the incredibly talented Dom, John, Melody, Nate, Noah, Ryan, and Remco. Brendan is the amazing residency manager on this project, and Marissa will be playing an intro game with them, which they didn't really know about, but it'll be fun, and uh, she'll be uh, talking with them on their projects and, and their learnings throughout this res residency. I've, I will include a link to each artist's bio and a brief description of their projects in the chat uh, soon, so I do encourage you to look more into that. And, and follow their work on their social media. And I, I will also post it, I'll post the social handles besides, besides their, their names on the PDF, you'll see that too. Um, so without further ado, Marissa, uh, please do guide us uh, on this next 85 minute journey. And I'm really looking forward to hearing what we'll learn and over to you, thank you. Thanks, Kyla. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay, great. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. I I, I, uh, I need to cut that bio down. It sounds really long. Um, so um, quick question, did anybody get an afternoon nap in? It's perfect autumn napping weather. Yeah, Dom did, yes, very good. Um, but if you didn't, I was thinking about what we would do for a little warm up exercise and a lot of them that you can find online are super corny. Um, so instead, what I thought would be fun is if, each of the artists could read out their own bio, like in third person, including Bren Brendan, do you have yours also? Uh, I could get it. Why don't you get it? And then is everybody okay with that? Just sort of reading out your quick bio for us all. Who's gonna go first? Let's go with Ryan. <laughs> I'm unprepared. I'm looking it up. I think it's in the, um, I, I think I shared it. Can I, do the, can I just, um, can I just wing it? You can wing it. <laughs> okay, wing it. Uh, I have to talk about myself in the third person though. That's a key part of this exercise. It would be uh, fun. Okay. You can have like two minutes okay. to do it. Okay. Uh, Ryan Steck is uh, an artist, uh, designer, uh, educator, uh, cultural worker, some other things too. It's probably written in the bio. It's like word <laughs> games in there. Um, and uh, yeah, I've been involved in the cultural world in Ottawa for, oh, I, no. Uh, he has been involved in the cultural world uh, of Ottawa for over 20 years. Um, he started as a documentary filmmaker. Um, uh, and uh, began getting involved in experimental work and live performance work, uh, and then uh, started to also get involved in cultural administration, became the artistic director of Art Engine in early 2000s, um, and has uh, not been able to leave since. Um, and uh, uh, also have a background in architecture, or he also has a background in architecture in which he's done um, some educating uh, and some research continuing a PhD um, that will never ever finish probably. And uh, I am also a teacher uh, at the University of Ottawa where I'm right here right now. You're in my classroom technically. Uh, they go, whatever. How would I say that in the third person? <laughs> you came in yeah. under time, that was amazing. I like, the, I like the stress, the stress is good for us. 
<laughs> How about we go to um, Melody? Could you please give us your bio or read us your bio, whichever you prefer? Uh, en français or in English? Comme vous voulez. <laughs> okay, but uh, it's going to be in French because uh, I never try in English. Okay. Um, Mélodie puise de son métissage autochtone de sa mère originaire de la communauté Mi'kmaq et son père est originaire de France. Ses racines imprègnent ses valeurs environnementales et sa pratique artistique. En tant qu'artiste écologique passionné par le patrimoine et l'action sociale, Mélodie, la ressourcière, se spécialise dans la réalisation de concepts rassembleurs et participatifs. Ses installations, ses sculptures et ses interventions elle utilise des objets désuets qui s'accumulent inutilement dans l'environnement en mettant en lumière la relation de cause à effet de l'exploitation des ressources naturelles. La ressourcière attire l'attention sur l'impact de l'humain sur la biodiversité et les écosystèmes. Elle pose un regard troublant sur la perte du patrimoine, des cultures ancestrales et des liens sacrés où se côtoient science et confiance. Ok, merci beaucoup. Next up, Dom Lafontaine. All right, since we're, we're going to be bilingual, let's, uh, I'm going to do both of them because I wrote my own, or he wrote his own. <laughs> Il a écrit son, sa propre biographie. Uh, this is, it's, pro it's probably the hardest thing to do as an artist is to write about yourself in the third person. I don't know if anybody else feels that way, but it is tough. All right, so I'll go with it. Here we go. Dominique Lafontaine is an Algonquin multimedia artist, poet, and musician. His audacious, humorous, and often absurd uh, artworks explore the very notions of cultural identity, meaning, and belonging. A graduate of uh, visual arts at Ottawa University, he synthesizes his knowledge of traditional art forms with new media in order to re redefine the substance and visual language of contemporary Native art. He also puts a whole lot of words in one line. Uh, his motto is research, remix, and repeat. Uh, I'll do the French, en français. Uh, Dominique Lafontaine est un artiste, poète, et musicien algonquin. Ses œuvres artistiques, souvent audacieuses, humor humoreuses, et, abs et absurdes, <laughs> explorent les notions d'identité, de sens et d'appartenance culturelle. Un gradué en art visuel à l'Université d'Ottawa, il cherche à synthétiser sa connaissance de l'histoire de l'art autochtone avec les nouveaux médias afin de redéfinir la substance et le vocabulaire esthétique de l'art Anishinaabe contemporain. Et il parle et il utilise bien trop de mots aussi en français. Euh, son motto, c'est « Recherche, remix et répète ». That was he, c'était lui. Parfait, merci, thank you. How about John? Can we hear from John? You're on mute, John. Hello? Oh, crap. We can hear you, hear you loud and clear, John. Got you okay. now. What happened is that when I went to click on the message in the chat box, I lost this, I lost the, uh, the screen. I'll just go ahead and talk. Uh, and sure. Talk. Yeah, what can I say? Okay, so this guy, Ciprano, um, he started living in Rhode Island back about Oh, over 70 years ago. Uh, as a kid, he was pretty interested in weather and playing, and it eventually ended up becoming art. And also with the passion for the nature and the environment. So as time went on, he did a degree in physics just to see if he could become a meteorologist. It didn't go very well. And his physics teacher told him, like, you know, really, uh, you should go ahead and pursue your career as an artist and just have the weather as a hobby took his advice and ended up going to the University of Rhode Island and then within a year was on scholarship for painting. Uh, <laughs> it was a very interesting school, a lot of fun, and also in very uh, disturbing times like we are 
experiencing today socially, Vietnam War, et cetera. Uh, eventually, I ended up eventually he ended up traveling into uh, Canada, visiting the Maritimes, and fell in love with the entire country. Sooner or later, ended up living in Ottawa, finished his Bachelor of Fine Arts degree at the University of Ottawa, and became a, a citizen somewhere around 1991. In the meantime, he started to study some photography at Ottawa U, uh, studied under Evergon and a few other really fantastic people like Charles Gagnon. And uh, the focus of the photography was primarily on nature and then discovering this wonderful site called Remick Rapids Park, which was as natural as anything could be and loaded with all of these rocks, one little step at a time, interest from just seeking out a peaceful place with the water, ended up discovering these rocks. Curiosity ended up making sculptures. And that was back in 1986, and he's continued to do it to the very present, and been very fortunate with the Canada Council grant back in 1989, and then working with the federal government, the National Capital Commission, under land management since the year 2000. Uh, in the meantime, he learned how to do some permanent sculptures and has had projects with Minto and uh, other very interesting people for residential projects and uh, waiting on one right now. Yeah, that sums it up. I love it. And I was I very think, appreciative of things. Hey, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thanks for a lifetime of art making. That's all I know. <laughs> now I'm going to try and get the screen back. Okay, we're going to we're going to hear from Remco now. I can hear everybody. Okay. Uh, Remco Volner is a researcher, producer and collaborator, a graduate of Utrecht University of Arts Creative Media program. His work is focused on technologically mediated collective experiences. As a cultural producer, he has organized a variety of exhibitions and festivals, including the Electric Fields Festival and Maker Fair Ottawa. His research interests include experimental models for the creative ecology, art as a civic practice, and new ways to assemble. He is the managing director of Art Engine, Ottawa's Center for Art and Technology. Pretty succinct. Thanks, Remco. Let's go to Noah. All right, hi there. I have a pretty concise one as well today. So, Noah Scheinman is a multidisciplinary artist, designer, and writer. His project based practice explores the intersecting histories of environment, technology, and culture, combining extensive research and build work with experimental approaches to making. Working between sculpture, installation, and moving image, his recent projects are particularly focused on material and geographic transformations and how the legacy of industrial modernity continues to shape present and future temporalities. Thanks, Noah. Hi, Nate. My pleasure. Can Hello. We, can we hear from you, Nate Nettleton? Sure, yeah, mine's quite concise too, so. Uh, Nate Nettleton is a Canadian artist um, exploring possibility, progress, and the importance of simplicity through abstract sculpture. Uh, Nate's works are held in private and public collections across Canada, the United States, and the United Kingdom. Uh, his artworks have been featured in Canadian and American art publications exhibited at various galleries across North America and are currently represented by Wall Space Gallery in Ottawa and Liz Lidget Gallery in Iowa. Nate, I think you need to add to that. <laughs> we need to, we'll work on that after this. Okay, we can do that later. Okay, thank you. And now let's go to Brendan de Montigny. Okay, <clears throat> uh, also short and concise. Uh, Brennan A. DeMontney, born Vancouver in 1984, received an MFA from the University of Ottawa in 2013, a BFA from Concordia University in painting and drawing with a minor in print media in 2009, and a DEC from Heritage College. 
De Montney is a Gatineau, Ottawa-based multidisciplinary artist, cultural connector, and curator. He has exhibited drawings and performances and installations in Ottawa, Toronto, Montreal, and New York State. De Montney co-founded and directed the Ottawa Art Gallery PDA projects from 2014 to 2018. Uh, De Montney co-found, uh, oh yeah, no, I just said that. Uh, he, is a final, he was a finalist for the 2019 RBC Emerging Artist Award in Ottawa and um, has an upcoming exhibition with Claire Scherzinger, Colin Canary, and Tyler Armstrong at Karschmessel in November. Merci, Brendan. I feel like we should all, as artists, maybe every four months, read our, seat, our bios out loud to ourselves as a self-care practice. You know, like, we've actually done stuff. You guys, have, you're all very accomplished. Uh, yeah. Um, and that being said, we want to hear from you about your experience in the residency. And we're going to jump right in. Everybody gets two questions. Um, use your time wisely, please. Um, so I'm going to start out with the first question. This one is for Brendan and Melody. I'm going to read the questions both in French and English. So what specific roles do you think artists play in shaping and evolving cities in this moment? And quel rôle spécifique pensez-vous que les artistes ont dans le façonnement et l'évolution des environnements urbains en ce moment? Melody? Um, alors, pour façonner l'espace urbain, euh, le rôle des artistes, c'est ça, par rapport à leur public. Mais je trouve que ça amène euh, de la sensibilité, je trouve que ça amène euh, une autre approche par rapport à la lecture euh, du paysage versus les constructions, puis ça laisse aussi euh, une empreinte plus euh, émotionnelle dans le paysage, puis en même temps, ça permet de, de réfléchir à les lignes réfléchir à qu le sens ou euh, l'émotion qui nous rentre euh, dans, dans les pensées. You want to I go in English? <rire> no? Comme vous voulez, comme vous voulez. Okay. Mais personnellement, quand je marche à travers la ville, puis euh, je vois des sculptures, que ce soit des, des lignes contemporaines ou euh, des choses plus euh, patrimoniales ou euh, des hommages ou bien... Euh, des, 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 des références au passé, mais moi, je trouve que ça enrichit l'histoire des lieux, puis ça, ça rend plus, le milieu plus, euh, plus invitant à, à, à créer une histoire autour de ce milieu-là, de cet environnement-là. Mm -hmm. You want to translate, uh, Brendan? No, well, no I, I think that, I think it's, I think it's okay. wonderful to hear it in French. Okay. Um, and, um, yeah, d would you like to continue, or... I don't Shall know how many time we have. I don't know how many time we have. You have a couple more minutes if you wanted to add. Okay. Um, yeah. Ben, j'aime ça que les artistes puissent mettre une touche euh, au, au milieu urbain parce que souvent c'est maintenant il y a beaucoup d'artistes qui sont des, des architectes ou des artistes ingénieurs, mais à une époque c'était plus des statues qui étaient représentantes de l'histoire du passé. Puis maintenant on voit un mélange entre tout comme des lignes contemporaines, on voit des lignes plus euh, suggestives de, 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 des sculptures euh, qui, qui, qui nous inspirent d'autres choses. Puis j'aime la variété de, de l'histoire, du parcours qu'on peut faire à travers les différents lieux. Disons qu'il y, y a des régions qui sont plus avancées dans l'ouverture que d'autres, mais il y en a qui... Des régions dans le monde, je veux dire, où est-ce qu'il y a de l'art public, où est-ce qu'il y a... Moi, j'ai déjà été faire des voyages parce que dans les parcs, c'est incroyable, là, les, les œuvres qu'il y avait. Puis à Toronto, une fois, je suis montée sur une rue, puis il y, en avait, il, y en avait, il y en avait des dizaines. Ça devait être un événement spécial, sauf que ça enrichit beaucoup, beaucoup, beaucoup la visite du lieu et l'expérience pour, le, pour le, la personne. Fait que j'imagine quand tu as la chance de participer à cet enrichissement en tant qu'artiste, ben c'est vraiment précieux. Oui, oui. Bien dit. Merci. Um, Brendan, any thoughts? Um, yeah, I think that public artwork across Canada is an important part to sort of give a benchmark, not only to the community, but those visiting 
the varying cities on getting to know what the sort of local culture is about. And I think it's a really unique and beautiful opportunity when artists um, across different varying parts of their careers, be it emerging mid-career or established in the eyes of say larger bodies like Canada Council of the Arts have the opportunity uh, to be able to put forth their envisioning of what that uh, local culture means to them, uh, what the larger conversations that are happening and how those conversations are happening both when you look at it historically and politically and coming together in an exercise like this, Artists in Residence, what was really sort of fascinating in terms of looking at public artwork in Ottawa was that it was an opportunity for us to sort of unpack the eccentricities and the nuances of the land uh, at ZB and uh, hear from each other um, our uh, relationship to the land, but also our relationship coming in from whatever community that we are a part of. And so I think that you know, tailing that into this larger conversation about public artwork, uh, I, I strongly believe that it's the responsibility of the artists uh, to be the people that uh, sort of lay a foundation in a positive and constructive way of where we were, where we are at now, and where we are going. So that public artwork not only responds to sort of what is in vogue in the day, you know, uh, not just in terms of materiality that we see so often in the doldrums of some public artworks that we've seen uh, across Ontario and across the rest of the country, but how do we sort of create new ways of entry into the materiality and also the concepts and how do we create work that will uh, progress and that will resonate in the future for future generations. Uh, I think that that is uh, a better way to um, be a, a monument uh, if you will. It's a better way to be uh, uh, an active participant in the community and to invite people to engage and play with these spaces. And I think all the artists that were part of the residency uh, did a fantastic job at doing that. Thanks, Brendan. Well said. And I agree with you um, on all counts. Um, okay, question two. Um, this is for Remco and Ryan. As longtime collaborators who have produced works in partnership with municipalities and cultural organizations, what does true co-design mean to you? Did you achieve this goal during the residency? Why or why not? Ryan? Um, what is true co-design? Well, I think, um, you know, that one of the things that we've talked about over the years, um, in our work together, Remco and I is, um, you know, I guess, uh, co-design would align with, with how we try and understand different ideas about collaboration, um, and partnership, um, and exchange these different notions sometimes that we use and collaboration for us is kind of like uh, something that we hold very dear uh, to our hearts and also something we professionally strive for but it's a very complicated thing to achieve and part of that is about risk um, uh, true collaboration happens when when the parties involved are um, willing to take risks and allow the thing to be greater than the sum of its parts, which means it transforms the individual and the organization involved in that. Um, I think that depending on the frame of, you know, which with you look at this collaboration or this, this residency, it did, it did meet that to some degree. If you look at it in the context of other um, relationships that developers might have with artists, um, they certainly open themselves up to a certain kind of risk that is not standard. Um, in terms of how you do these things and the way they turn to um, Artscape uh, to try and uh, help them understand how to, how to navigate that risk and bring another party into it. Um, you know, so there is a, there's elements of collaboration, but then there's also very clear uh, boundaries defined. It's more partnership. It's a mix of partnership and collaboration. There's very clear boundaries about, you know, uh, who is doing what and how that, that works out. And that's, that's really, you know, um, that is necessary. Neither is sort of a higher value or lower value. I don't know if Remco wants to follow up with things. Thanks, Ryan. Remco, anything to add to that? 
Yeah, it would be funny if I said no at this point and then just left it. Um, <laughs> uh, but the um, it, it, when we talk about the ideal of a of a co-design, uh, would be that the people who uh, uh, are meant to be the beneficiaries of the work are included in the actual design of the work and everything that that comes with it, and not in the sense of um, you know what you see often that the works are already displayed on a table and uh, the, the community is invited to come in and fill out a form, but true co-design would, would uh, uh, put the, the beneficiaries central to uh, the process. And now that's obviously a really um, difficult thing to imagine and the original before the lockdown uh, I have to say that the original intent of this residency with uh, with Atelier uh, was to be embedded into the site itself and having having a, a, a physical space within the site where the work is meant to go would allow already far more from that to have continued uh, consultations, having the artists embedded into the work of the developers and of the so that you have this this flattened but continuously um, uh, reverberating uh, talk amongst everybody involved. In, in a developer situation, it's almost impossible to have a, a true co-design as well, because the idea would also be, you know, citizens and dwellers of the space would also have a have a have a kind of part in it, but at that you know in in the developer or typical public art context is often things are going into places that are new, um, so um, that you know um, that part of it. Um, that being said, you know clearly um, uh, Zibi has has done an in incredible amount of engagement with the with the stakeholders uh, and indigenous people and uh, and you know sit layers of city government and and all of that. So there's. At, at, with this project, this, the scale is quite uh, overwhelming, really. Yeah, agreed. And I, I, the, the nature of, of the virtual residency also, I think um, it's a testament to how all of you uh, communicating with each other have developed or, or came with um, pretty comprehensive communi communication skills or learned how to develop them over the course of this, um, given the fact that you weren't on site and you weren't sharing space with each other. Um, I think that it's, um, it's really impressive. When I, when I think about how you're all in your own little offices or studios and that you, you all produce the um, projects that you did, that, that you, that you ideated in the way that you did. It's really, really quite impressive considering that you, you were dealing with, um, um, you know, support materials basically um, and your own research. And um, I commend you all for that. It's, it's, it's really something that's um, a difficult thing to pull off on a good day. Um, and so uh, in the spirit of a communication, um, I have a question about uh, learning. And um, given that Zibi and the Chaudière Falls site are geographically and culturally a place of intersection and how this residency mirrors that intersection by bringing you all together in this virtual space, what is something that you learn from a fellow resident that you might have not if you had been working independently. Um, Nate, can I, can I ask you to answer that? Can we hear what you have to say? Sure, yeah. Um, my project, I was able to um, kind of collaborate with uh, Christina, who was one of the um, people uh, brought in onto the project um, from the Memengueshi Council. Um, I just, I, I felt as a non-Indigenous artist on this project, um, I felt very inspired by what I was learning from, um, from her and from Jose and the other um, Indigenous uh, guest lectures that we had brought on. Um, 
And I kind of felt like, especially Christina was, uh, you know, kind of a huge asset to, uh, to the entire residency, but to specifically the project that, that I was able to, you know, work on and collaborate with, with her. She brought such a, um, you know, kind of like a, a safe, comfortable space for um, asking questions about, um, you know, Indigenous culture, history, that sort of thing, as well as sharing a whole bunch of, um, you know, important knowledge and information with, with all of us. Um, so I think uh, for me to be able to kind of behind the scenes do research and be able to approach her, um, you know, from digitally to, to start with, it was more comfortable for me to kind of, uh, I guess, formulate my questions and like figure out how I can approach this project that I really want to do, but I'm not totally sure how to appropriately a approach it. So to have her there to facilitate that and to um, answer questions and to just bring that expertise to the table um, was super helpful, was super helpful for me and my project. Thanks, Nate. Um, same question for Dom, please. Um, what is something that you learned from a fellow resident that you might have not if you had been working independently? Well, I think uh, what, a lot of the history stuff, I mean, a few of you guys here had work, already worked on it, um, some of the history stuff, like uh, Ryan and Noah. I know you guys got, like, gave us all these, like, documents. I was like, whoa, <laughs> I'm up against big dogs here. What's going on? <laughs> so uh, that really was uh, the stuff, like, the, the, that kind of stuff. And also the chance, because I'm, I'm far away. I'm 500 kilometers north. So the chance to just talk to, uh, you know, other artists, but that are actually in Ottawa and are also co co U O U of O grads. And uh it's just uh it's yeah, it's a chance that I wouldn't have had for sure, especially on in the uh virtual way. Because I also had a chance to work on an actual regular residency in a in a gallery not far from here, Les Corps, Centre d'Art Visuel. <laughs> a little plug there. Uh and uh yeah, it was it's a very it's, it's so many things that I can I can tell, like uh just we just the fact that we got to share all, all of our ideas and we got to like kind of have a crit with each other and a few laughs a few drinks and we it was it was cool it was really it was really fun sounds like it i'm jealous <laughs> um, it must have been nice to to have to have access to your fellow residents in that way and share if there's such a rich culture uh, rich history on that site there's a lot to know um, and I mean, you only had 10 weeks to figure all of this stuff out. So, yep. um, here's to, uh, working together. Um, John, can I ask you the same question? What is something that you learned from a fellow resident? Oh, I learned an awful lot. Um, uh, for some reason, the video is not working. So it, pardon that. Uh, no, I learned a lot because like I'm the oldest guy in the group <laughs> and everybody being so much younger than myself, there was a lot of information coming in that I was kind of naive about and it just helped me understand better how, how much I've changed <laughs> in my practice and also how to adapt it to working in a group and also I, I don't think I've had this much contact with so many artists so often since perhaps I left university. So in that respect, it was a very reassuring experience. I really enjoyed it. In terms of what I learned, I don't know how to phrase it, but I mean, the technological approach to having an online residency surely was a huge learning curve. I have to say that. But from each and every artist, I think I took in some information that helped me realize how things are changing in terms of the public art and how that impacts what I've been doing so many years. You know, you get pretty comfortable doing what you do and you forget that the rest of the world keeps on moving along. Um, 
And the influence that happened this year with my regular project on Rimmick Rapids Park was that this residency influenced the production of that project. I can't put it into words easily because it's a strictly feeling, emotional experience. But what I gleaned from our meetings every week and then went down to the river to produce my work, I found a really new energy. And quite frankly, the end result is that a lot of the people who have been watching my work for many years, they've all said the same thing. You really outdid yourself this year. And I said, well, there was a lot of inspiration coming in from other sources that really stimulated my energy to produce as much as possible. Who knows how many more years I've got left as an artist doing public art. That crossed my mind too, particularly by being surrounded by so many younger people. I love it. So, I mean, I thank everybody just for being who you are and how you shared your experiences enough for me to uh, integrate that into my own practice. So, yeah, I really did benefit from this experience. Wonderful. So, thank you, thank everybody. You, <laughs> thank you, Ron. Thank you. I have to throw this out to everybody on the panel and everybody watching or listening that it's pretty unusual to have a residency um, and spend time with people that you're actually, quote unquote, um, competing against. And to, to it's, an, it's an interesting dynamic to know that to have to work in concert with your um, competition, quote unquote competition. Um, and I think that that's a, that, could, that could, could prove challenging for a lot of people, but it seems like um, you all fell into it, fell into step pretty nicely. Um, okay, we're almost done. We've got two more questions. The next one goes out to everybody, some version of this question. Um, so this is for Noah, Remco, Ryan, Nate, and John. As settlers, what are you learning about how to navigate the process of producing public art on public land? Um, Noah, can we hear from you? Sure, my text is a little choppy. Would you mind just repeating it? It sounds like a pretty specific question, so would you mind repeating it, please? As settlers, what are you learning about how to navigate the process of producing public art on public land? Um, well, I think in my, my practice, um, you know, I had done quite a bit of research into this site and um, you know, but those, uh, a lot of those kind of methods were, um, even though sort of I was aware of um, the fact that it was on unceded um, Algonquin territory, um, I was also quite aware that a lot of my own methods of research um, are very sort of um, uh, structured in a very kind of colonial way in terms of like the, my own educational background and my own way of working. Um, so um, I kind of learned a lot in, Sort of just kind of listening um, and thinking about other ways to sort of um, approach the site, having already kind of gone um, kind of deeply and kind of broadened in my own way, and then sort of to like sort of step back and kind of listen and, and hear what the other kind of um, work that's sort of been done in terms of having a, um, a different kind of more sort of collective conversation about it versus just, you know, a person in the library or a person sort of working in a more kind of individual way. Um, and so that's something that I feel uh, was sort of recognized early on. And then the fact that the whole um, residency was a more of a collective conversation, um, I felt started to make that feel uh, sort of slowly and incrementally a little bit more part of the way that I kind of wanted to work um, and sort of what led to my, my proposal for the end um, of, the, uh, of the residency. Thanks, Noah. Um, Remco, would you like me to repeat the question? No, no that's okay. Thanks. Um, uh, yes. Yeah, so certainly the things that uh, that Noah said, and and to add to that, so that that idea of um, 
in in a sense getting out of the way uh, and uh, picking up on Noah's uh, listening uh, comment. Um, I think an important one was the realization that even if you if you do this research and you you um, talk to uh, the the people uh, to the indigenous people uh, whose whose uh, land we're on and where we uh, had intention to work, is that you're still you're still extracting something. Uh, in this case, information or history or knowledge or anything of the sort, uh, so that you have to be uh, very mindful of what are you what are you giving in return when you when you take something uh, away at that level, um, and that is that that was an important realization. And because we we spoke with uh, with uh, a number of the uh, of the advisors on the project, which was a, a really uh, wonderful opportunity and and experience uh, so we're uh, we're we're quite uh, grateful for that thanks Remco well, uh, can I follow up with that can I yes up it's there? Ryan's it's turn. turn yes um, <clears throat> I think uh, and I, I would continue to maybe even push it into uh, more I guess esoteric territory but there's a, there's a really wonderful tension, right? And uh, something to unpack in the question itself, um, talking about settlers um, and the idea of public art and public um, space, both kind of European constructions <laughs> in and of themselves. And so finding new language and new ways to talk about the things that we do in common in the city. So one of the things I think that's particular um, to this, uh, if the, this process that we all went through, um, and that's very really important about it, is that they gave the time to think about and understand the place. Um, so the difference between, say, the, those words space and place. Place is particular. Place is a thing. Um, publics are, tend to be you these generalized things that could kind of mean everybody, but they usually don't mean everybody. Um, and what we were doing here is to think about um, what the particular aspect of putting art in this particular place and who is meant to be uh, and who should be included in the discussions about what that is. So there it's, it's uh, I think um, what, uh, I mean, this was something that I spent a lot of time thinking about. So before this, so it wasn't, it, but what was unique uh, about this experience and very special was to be able to, as, as Remco said, and, um, that we had access um, to uh, thoughts and ideas about the place um, that were difficult outside of this residency to access. Um, and that's a really important uh, part of putting together a process in which we think about um, who are the voices um, around a table uh, in an urban environment and in the shared spaces, the common aspects of what we do in a city. Thank you, Ryan. And those are great those are great musings and 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 i guess an attendant question is also is you know who who is listening to the voice who's asking for the voices uh to be heard also a really interesting counterpoint um okay nate can we hear from you about this yeah um so i learned that uh you know it's super important to, you know, really consider what you're, what you're going to do and what you're going to propose, what you're going to make ultimately, uh, and how it's, you know, it's how it's going to affect the viewers. Um, so like, as, as we were hearing from, uh, you know, guest lectures with indigenous backgrounds, um, I, I kind of felt like I fell into this category of, uh, you know, like a large percentage of our Canadian population doesn't have this, you know, like basic knowledge of the land's history. And um, I just, I felt like personally, I wanted to learn more and explore that more and bring and use that in my, uh, in my artwork. So I had to ask a ton of questions, uh, you know, listen, do lots of research, collaborating with folks who have the knowledge. Um, 
you know, take it super seriously, but then um, kind of taking a note from Dom's book, take it seriously, but not too seriously. Like, you know, there's, uh, and his work is a testament to that. There's lots of humor and like, there's this, you know, a lighter side to um, all this, you know, important, serious, um, these topics that we're talking about here. Um, so yeah, just, you know, working through ideas as much as possible and ensuring what you're bringing to the table is appropriate. Yeah, here, here. Thank you. Um, I can just add well, to that, just the notion, just to reinforce something that, that, that Noah was saying, and I think came up and you were asking a question about what we learned from each other. And um, I, I think there's also the fact that what we, what kinds of things were we reassured about <laughs> the way artists are? Um, things that we probably, weren't new to probably many of us, um, the way we mix politics and humor, um, the way we think about materiality. There were commonalities that weren't, I don't think, new to anybody, but I think what was special about being together um, with uh, artists and creators at all stages of their career and talking about this thing was how reassuring um, that experience is, that there, somehow you can create a collective of people who talk uh, and speak and bring all kinds of different experience to the table. Um, and it's not like we're all the same, um, but yet there is a commonality, a kind of like a weave that ties us all together that makes for a really interesting fabric. And I think it was reassuring to everyone that such diversity could come together um, mm. and, uh, and be really fruitful to everyone. Um, that's a wonderful insight to hear, especially given that um, there's so much polarization um, and, and politicization of um, a lot of conversations in this time. Mm -hmm. um, it's really inspiring to hear that you, you, you as a collective could share information and move forward. Um, oh, I'd like to hear from John about oh, this I too. Dom's laughter. <laughs> what, I'm sorry, what? John, uh, sure, yeah. I'd like to hear from you about this. As, as a settler, what are you learning about how to navigate the process of producing public art on public land? Uh, quite frankly, I've been fortunate for the last plus 30 years to have that experience, which enlightened me as to how public art innocently can impact uh, community, so that eventually I began to identify with the work as being community-based. It's for the community. I've even used the term art for the common man, or common person, if you like, not necessarily designed to entertain an exclusive body of artists or culturally-based uh, people. So the whole thing is to create and establish community through public art. That's my conclusion from the work that I've done. And what I see happening with Zibi is a wonderful way to show how wonderfully interesting Canada and how wonderful this particular location is. We have a tremendous amount of green space, which most, most places in the world just doesn't have it. So public art in Canada has a very unique environment. You know, we have a very green city with Ottawa, Gatineau. And so the natural environment becomes an essential part of public art. Uh, and in this way, it's different than being inside the city. And, you know, like I would use, uh, graffiti art or you know that type of uh idea as a comparison to working in the public with with a location like zibi another thing too the fact that there's three rivers three cultures all integrating in one place uh, also has been a fascination of my own for many many years you know and just to see how delightful all of these different influences can come together in a, a really very peaceful environment, culture. I think the whole point of public art is to enlighten people to not be absorbed in negative 
uh, perceptions of the world around them. I think I'm done. Okay, thank you for being so hopeful. <laughs> I can't help it. I have nothing it's so else. So hard to find. <laughs> I recommend not, not, more, not, not just hope, but trust that, you know, we'll figure it out as we go along. We're always going to be challenged in the way that we assemble. So, you know, there's going to be different ways to approach that. But I think that, like as experienced with this residency, uh, it wasn't a competition. It was a compliment to each one of us to see how our process could be presented in a way so that other people, other artists, you know, the co-design team, you know, could appreciate what, as a team, we've all come up with. Because we have influenced each other, I know. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, Dom, as an Indigenous artist, what are you learning about how to navigate the inherent tension with settler culture um, in the process of producing public art? Uh, I think it's not really the us and them kind of thing. If I'm half settler. I'm half native. I'm, I speak French and English. I live on the border of uh, the border of Ontario and in Quebec. I'm between both worlds, all kinds of worlds, really. And I kind of think that's what the site is kind of like, really. You know, it's all mixed up. Let's not, figure, let's, not, let's not pretend. There's all kinds of levels of failures and, you know, wins and wins and losses and the whole story of the place. So I think it's more about just let's get the human part. Let's, you know, like instead of playing politics and all these other heavy things, let's, let's keep it light. Let's, let's, let's see, well, you know, like, I think especially this, this residency is the one that kind of made me like uh, trust my gut when it comes to the whole humorous side of what I work with and how in the Algonquin culture, it's definitely a big part. It's, you know, we've been through some pretty tough stuff. <laughs> and I mean, also, you know, Fra Francophone Quebecers and whatnot. And, uh, so and Franco Ontarians, which I am probably one. So it's just seeing that you know, it's you can stop playing power games for a while. Let's just have a laugh, have a share some ideas, create um, you know, just basic stuff. Keep it human. I love it. So remix, you know, research, remix, repeat, have a laugh. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, melody. Um, étant une artiste indigène uh, autochtone, qu'apprenez-vous du processus de créer de l'art dans le domaine public? Je me demande la question. Oui. Um, je me pose la question parfois par rapport à le côté plus traditionnel puis le côté plus contemporain. Um, je trouve que l'idée d'amener l'expression euh, traditionnelle puis euh, dans le monde contemporain, ça va bien. Puis il ne faut pas oublier aussi que, du point de vue artistiquement euh, autochtone, c'est beaucoup relié au sacré, c'est beaucoup relié à tout ce qui est la connexion à la terre, la connexion de la compréhension de la bio, de, de, des animaux, de, du vent, c'est beaucoup animiste. Donc, c'est à un niveau que certains artistes qui sont non autochtones aussi vont accéder. Mais c'est vraiment euh, intéressant de comprendre euh, de plus en profondeur le côté sacré, puis de le faire aussi ressortir dans notre art, puis en même temps de l'apporter au public, puis qu'ils ressentent ça à travers l'art. C'est ça que j'apprécie beaucoup euh, des inspirations euh, du métissage de l'art, puis euh, avec euh, l'histoire des lieux, parce que c'est un lieu très, très, très euh, puissant avec la rivière, puis avec l'histoire qu'il y avait là-bas avant la, la colonisation. J'imagine qu'il y avait beaucoup, beaucoup, beaucoup de communautés qui se rassemblaient, puis qu'il y avait déjà de la mixitude, puis beaucoup d'échanges. fait que ça, ça transpose, puis ça... C'est fort comme énergie, puis comme processus dans la création qu'on peut vivre là-bas. 
Puis ce que j'aime, c'est le côté sacré qu'on peut emmener euh, avec euh, le partage de, de nos créations. Merci, Melody. Plaisir. OK, this is it. This is the last question. And then we're going to go to Q&A. Um, so this question is for Brendan, who was the residency overlord and den mother, and for Noah, who has a background in architecture and urban planning. What cultural shifts, supports, investments, or collaborations do you want to see as public art begins to play a larger role in sustaining culture in our cities? Brendan, you want to go first? Yeah, sure. That's an excellent question. Um, before I forget, though, I just want to mention to everybody, I miss you all. I just realized it's been an exact month since we <laughs> finished the residency. So this is such a delight to see all of you together again and having these really important conversations. That was one of the foundations of what we were trying to do at the beginning, which is let, let's learn from each other and then let's make and let's play. Um, so that's an excellent question. I think that that's a really good, probably entry point to what I would probably say to that. There's a lot of systemic issues in the way that art is accessible for not only the public, but also for the artists and even for those that want to be artists and try to create. And I think that um, at a city level, a municipal level, both within Gatineau and Ottawa, we need to start supporting um, people who want to go outside of the STEM programs academically. And I think that also at the municipal level, we need to offer programs for youth uh, to be able to have access uh, to ways of being in play with their neighborhoods and their public. Um, you know, I think that Gatineau made a first right move in terms of offering um, sort of free walls where people can, you know, spray paint on or, or draw on. I think that that is a good first step. But in terms of actual public artwork, I think that there needs to be uh, more investment in, in the way that we communicate with the public and also being realistic and upfront. I've seen uh, countless times since the pandemic, there's a movement towards the idea of public art instead of the uh, like private closed uh, white cube gallery. And what I'm seeing is that there's, uh, you know, sort of pitches your budget. You know, I think by offering, uh, being upfront with artists, being like, look, we have 5,000, we have $50,000, all are welcome, you know, and really trying to break down those barriers of s saying it is okay to enter this space and offering resources prior to a deadline on those that want to enter that space. Having those sort of foundational um, techniques to lift the community up, the community of artists up, um, will only create better results. Um, so that's one thing that I would really like to see from a, a municipal level. And then, you know, again, I think we really have to take a long, hard look get in contact with our local school boards and, and demand for more uh, creative uh, disciplines being reintroduced into the classroom. Uh, I think that these are things that will uh, create long-term effects rather than short-term solutions. And in terms of the short-term, the more money you throw at the arts, the better it is for artists to survive. That's the bottom line. Put an addendum on Brandon's thing and saying non-parents have to advocate for things in the school thing because the parents are just <laughs> busy being parents and can't advocate for things half the time in the school system. So if all you non-parents would be like, this is what we want to see in the schools, more cultural education, <laughs> lend a helping hand on that one. <laughs> Takes a village, you know. Here. Well said, Ryan. <laughs> here, here. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, so Noah, what about you? I can reread the question yeah. if you want. No, I got it this time. Okay. Um, yeah, I think I sort of had two two comments. I mean, one, I think just fundamentally, like um, starting with uh, like the land that a piece of public artwork is on is something that um, you know right away you know can be part of the discussion because it leads to some sort of really kind of critical reflection about like where that 
land comes from and the sort of processes by which that land even sort of became public or public private. Um, so in the context of Zibi, you know, that's something that's been very much um, a focus of, of the residency, but I think in any kind of public artwork, um, that should be part of the conversation for sure. Um, and then the, my other kind of comment was sort of taking a little bit of a different um, perspective and, you know, really just uh, after the residency, I was sort of imagining um, as these projects get built over time um, and, you know, we're not necessarily there to have the conversation, but the works themselves are in conversation and the fact that they do bring these different approaches, these different, uh, you know, positionalities and personal backgrounds and relationships to that side and land uh, in general and the idea of Canada in general. Um, they will, so having them, you know, kind of be throughout the site or throughout the city and seeing what kind of conversations and dialogue emerge between the different artworks um, is another way of thinking about what kinds of important cultural um, conversations are kind of happening. Um, and they become, you know, not only landmarks in terms of marking a space, but in terms of marking the kinds of, um, of discourse and uh, reflections that, you know, should be kind of ongoing uh, in a way. Um, so. Uh, that's kind of a sort of a, a newer idea from 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 me uh, in terms of what the different kind of public arts artworks are situated um, within a sort of um, cluster kind of might might be able to do. That's a really interesting idea. I feel like because public art is planned in such a way that it's sort of piecemeal in a lot of places, you know, like money, uh, a site becomes available, money becomes available, and we just sort of keep adding on. Um, and I like the also the idea of the works being in conversation with each other. Yeah. Um, I, I feel like we see that a lot in group shows, like indoors, uh, and yet in the exterior, in, in exterior spaces, maybe not so much. Um, thank you. Thank you all. Um, we're going to do some questions. We have a couple of Q&A questions from our attendees. Um, and whoever wants to jump in if you, um, if you um, want to answer. Uh, here's well, the first one. I, I was reading the first one and thought that this is a pretty good jump off from Noah's. Uh, yeah. Comment, um, about, you know, seeing the diversity of Ottawa reflected in the creation of public art locally. Um, and I, I think it's part and parcel the, the exact thing that you were just talking about. Well, maybe it's broader to uh, the nature of public art the way it is, um, <clears throat> makes it very difficult to support um, a diversity um, of practices because not just not, not diversity of artists, but literally a diversity of practices, a certain type of practice is fit because of a certain conception of what public art is. So um, if you began to imagine what would happen if you saw, rather than art being permanent, which is a joke, permanency doesn't exist, right? Everything changes. So it, rather if you thought, well, we're doing this project for 10 years and then in 10 years, something else will happen or five years or three years. But if you could put all these terms on public art and that that would then open up a whole range of practices because um, you have to make decisions that then limit materiality and types of practices so that, you know, only really stone and all this steel. I mean, how many Ottawans are tired of seeing, you know, uh, laser cut steel as public art? Um, mm -hmm. they, it's not that it doesn't have a place, but it comes to the only thing that you can do. So I think, it, you know, the, it's an extension of if you transform the way you think of what a public art infrastructure is like and and expect something different from the institutions that um, are guiding that policy then a, di then a then a greater diversity of practices and artists could be welcomed into the process uh, and then I, I think just to wrap up on that with we've all said here I think there's a the, this was special in the way that it allowed for mentorship it allowed for exchange between artists in a way that a public art so I think uh, many of uh, my colleagues here, um, I heard a number of times that this was sort of their first project of this scale, um, and they probably wouldn't get the same chance in a traditional public art competition. So mm -hmm. ideas that, that change the way decisions get made about what, what kind of um, you know, sculpture can be made would also transform that. 
Yeah, I'd just like to add directly to the question, you know, because I help facilitate this residency, the question is, do, you know, it, do, do the panelists believe that there is diversity in the different type of art, uh, public artworks in Ottawa? Uh, the simple answer is no, uh, there isn't, not yet. And I think by echoing what Ryan said, which is, you know, that this was an opportunity for a lot of emerging artists who would not have had entry into a budget of this size to propose projects, um, you know, can be used in the future, can be molded and reshaped towards other diverse groups. And in that even goes to how it is articulated to the public to get people involved. You know, so often do you need a BFA? Do you need that MFA as part of your bio? Um, you know, that will scare people off that might have an, a brilliant, brilliant idea for a public artwork for their neighborhood. And so I think by creating flexible solutions in co-design in collaboration will yield better results for each neighborhood within Ottawa. If I could play a little devil's advocate though too, some of the responsibility, let's say, stands within the cultural community as well in that, you know, um, what, what, do we, what do we think as, say, deep in the cultural community, artists who, who represent, you know, maybe the most experimental practices, what we think should happen in the city, that might not be the same as what the people in your neighborhood or the people in an area think should be represented. What is contemporary art <laughs> to many people? Um, so how do you, op if you're willing to open up the conversation, this is a, a can be a, uh, uh, can be an interesting way to bring different practices in, but that also has to be, I think, uh, tempered with the process of what people might want and expect and a dialogue about what the role of artwork in the common spaces of the city is really about. I love this conversation so much. I've been having this conversation for a year and a half, <laughs> anytime. Anytime I'm around anybody who will listen to, about, listen to me about it. Um, and I think it's fascinating. I think there's a, there's a, I wish we had a whole another hour, but I'm not sure that our attendees <laughs> wish that to be true. So let's, let's move to the second question. In the introductory remarks, Kyla said that Zibi was going to be the most sustainable community. This is a very broad statement. It could be seen as ambitious, but it can also be seen as marketing talk. I'd like to hear from participants what sustainability means for them in the context of the new neighborhood. Can I maybe like just add something really quickly and then maybe the artist can pick up on it. So um, I think that was slightly glossed over. Um, what I think Kyla was talking about is actually one of the sort of really interesting points about CBS development is that they're using the one planet living model, uh, mm -hmm. which is trying to create uh, 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 an environmental friendly neighborhood that is 100% sustainable. So as an example, a lot of the old um, lines that would heat uh, the gas for the old buildings are being, like the old factories that used to be there are being uh, reused. Those same sort of pathways are being reused to actually function in the exact same way. Technology that hasn't been used in 120 years that is eco-friendly is being revitalized for the buildings on ZB. Um, there are eight or nine different points for um, the One Planet Living objectives. And I think each one of the artists kind of took one of those and ran with it. So yeah, that's all I'll say on that. Anybody else want to go at a shot at this one? <laughs> okay. I'll give her a go. I'll give her a go. For the heck yeah, of it. please. Uh, <laughs> I think the, the idea also is of, uh, you know, there's sustainability, but there's also like the whole re rehabilitation of the site, which is really, really interesting, like, like to me, especially. It's uh, just the idea that they're taking like these old, like dirty old buildings, <laughs> making something livable at least, right? I mean, it's, sorry, I mean, sustainable and all of its keywords, whatever. Uh, but uh, I think just that idea of a, a, a re rehabilitation, and uh, like a rehabilitation of just like, just basic, um, what you call it? Basic uh, relationships, really. And like, uh, like, like, uh, like Brendan was saying, like there's like one part of the, there's different parts of the plan. And like the one I queued into was just basic happiness. Like to have a happy space. So something that's, you know, that used to be industrial and kind of funky 
You give it happy and funky instead. So yeah, that's just the way I would put it there. I would add to this that <clears throat> I, I can sense a degree of skepticism in the question. Um, uh, well, it's, it's not that hard to read. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I, I think it's a fair uh, amount of skepticism. I came into the project with a, with a deeply skeptical perspective on, the, on what I saw as a, as a, a citizen of the center of the city, uh, that this seemed like a lot of marketing jargon. Um, and you know, I, one of the things I learned is, is um, and I, you know, it didn't go in with a, uh, a resistance against it, but a skeptical mind. Uh, and there is, there is a lot of profound um, and genuine work being done in this project that is not done in your typical development project. The question of sustainability is a pretty big one. Um, how do you put, what yardstick, what do you use to measure these kinds of things is a big question. Uh, sustainable against what? Is it more sustainable than not building? <laughs> Probably not. Concrete's a pretty terrible structure or a terrible material that does a lot of bad things. But um, this is um, unlike any other uh, development I've seen from afar and from up close. So. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, Melody? Oui, ben, c'est sûr que l'idée de l'image euh, est meilleure quand qu on construit plus vert de nos jours, mais il est temps, et ça fait vraiment longtemps qu'il est temps qu'on aille dans cette voie-là, puis on est vraiment en retard, alors peut-être que ça aide le marketing d'une grande entreprise, mais s'il vous plaît, allez tous vers, aider votre marketing pour aller à, vers l'écologie, puis aider, le, que, améliorer nos, nos environnements, nos écosystèmes, parce que si on attend de, de le faire, ou on juge ceux qui créent des mouvements, ou qui créent des idées, puis on on pointait seulement les, le côté, ben c'est juste pour l'apparence ou c'est juste pour bien paraître, ben on n'y arrivera pas. Au contraire, allez, go, allez-y, construisez écologique, puis soyez euh, One Living Planet ou toutes les autres certifications, s'il vous plaît. Puis le fait qu que le projet conserve le patrimoine, c'est de l'investissement aussi, dans le sens que ça serait moins cher de mettre tout à terre puis reconstruire. Alors, il y a quand même un choix de préserver l'histoire des lieux Idéalement, ça serait que tout soit vert puis dans la nature, mais pour l'instant, il y a de l'histoire là, puis euh, je trouve que l'effort qui est mis à conserver ces bâtiments-là est quand même euh, louable. Merci, Melody. Alors, euh, maison, n'est-ce pas? <rire> Lâche pas la patate. <rire> um, OK, I think that's it for me. I want to thank you all for talking to me. I'm going to see if Kyle is around. Um, and she's going to um, <laughs> offer us closing remarks and a little wrap up. Thanks, y'all. Yeah, thank you. You're all amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marissa. Thank you, Marissa. <laughs> thank, thank you so much. It, that was amazing. Um, thank you for sharing all your beautiful, thoughtful remarks and your insights and your knowledge. It's, it's amazing to learn from you guys. I came into this quite late. I, I came into this at the last three week mark with residency, but it was so amazing, even though I didn't see from the beginning. Um, I'm sure the journey would have even been even better if I had come in the beginning too. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to thank you all for taking the time today to really just think through the, your learnings and give us the feedback and, and so we can all learn really. And I'm, I learned a lot from all of you. So I just want to thank you all for that. Um, so again, Dom, John, Melody, Nate, Noah, Remco, and Ryan, thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm sure it's not the last we'll be seeing of, of any of you. I'm sure we'll see you on DB again and many other projects. Um, Brendan, of course, thank you for your leadership during this amazing residency. And I'm, again, I'm sure we'll see you again throughout the rest of the projects that are happening. Um, Marissa, thank you for your wonderful facilitation and your thoughtful questions. Um, I cannot do what you do. I'm, I'm not that minded, so I appreciate that. Thank you for being an amazing guide throughout this. Um, there was uh, some tech interesting things going on at the beginning, and that really is just the nature of doing things te with technology and the digital realm, and I'm sure we've all been there. So I thank you all who are come to participate and who registered and we wanted to make it a little bit more difficult for you to get here so that 
we knew you really wanted to be here. So that, yeah, I'm sure that was intentional. Um, but thank you for coming along on this journey with us. Um, I really encourage everyone to look at all of the artists and, and find them on social. I posted everything on the chat. Um, so feel free to online stalk them. And I'm sure they'll appreciate that. And you'll see their next projects and what they're working on. Um, I also would encourage everyone who's an artist to uh, go, with, go to the Atelier database um, and learn about any future opportunities you might have. This is one of a lot of projects, um, even though we're quite new. Um, it's, there's a lot of projects on the go, so I did want to just mention that. And I'm going to post right this moment so that it is up there in the chat. There we go. Um, so there's a link to the sign up page, and feel free to sign up there if you'd like to share more. Um, so yeah, that is everything from us. I want to thank everyone again, and I miss you all. We, we had these Zoom meetings like every two, two, twice every week, so it's weird not seeing your faces that often, but I'll just stalk you online also. <laughs> so thank you everyone again. Have a really great Friday, a really great weekend, and I hope to see you again soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye everyone. Thank you, thank you so much. Ciao. Keep it good. <laughs>